Vision of St. Agnes, Virgin, Martyr, 304, Rome. I saw a very lovely delicate maiden dragged through the streets by rude soldiers. She was wrapped in a long brown woolen mantle, her braided hair concealed under a veil. The soldiers seized her mantle by the sides and dragged her so violently forward that they tore it apart. They were followed by a crowd, among them a few women. She was led through a high gateway, across a square court, and into an apartment destitute of furniture, saving some long, cushioned chests. They pushed her in and dragged her from side to side, and tore from her both mantle and veil. Agnes was like an innocent patient lamb in their hands, and light and airy as a bird. She seemed to fly as they pulled her here and there. They took her mantle and left her. Agnes in a white, sleeveless undergarment open at the sides now stood back in the corner of the room praying calmly with outstretched hands and face upturned. The women who had followed her were not admitted into the courtyard. All sorts of men stood around the doors as if the saint were their common prey. I saw her white tunic bloody around the neck from a wound received, perhaps on the way. First two or three youths entered and fell upon her, furiously dragging her hither and thither, and tearing from her person the open garment. I saw blood on her neck and breast. She did not attempt to defend herself, for, on the instant they deprived her of her garments, her long hair fell down around her, and I saw a shining figure just above her in the air, who spread over her, like a garment, a stream of light. The wretches who had assaulted her fled terror-stricken. They encountered her insolent lover outside who began to mock their cowardice. He rushed in himself to seize her. But Agnes grasped him firmly by the hands and held him back. He fell to the ground, but arose quickly, and again rushed madly upon her. Again did the virgin drive him back as far as the door, and again did he fall, but this time motionless. She stood calm as before, praying, shining, blooming, her face like a brilliant rose. A loud cry was raised, and several distinguished personages hastily entered the room. One of them seemed to be the youth's father. He was furious, indignant, he spoke of sorcery but when Agnes told him that she would pray for his son's restoration, if he would ask it in the name of Jesus, he grew calm and begged her to do so. Then Agnes turned toward the dead youth, and addressed a few words to him. He arose, and was led away still weak and tottering. And now came other men toward Agnes but like the first they too retired in fright. Then I saw the soldiers go into the room. They took with them a brown robe, open at the side and fastened by a clasp, and an old veil such as were generally given to the martyrs. Agnes put the robe on, twisted her hair under the veil, and accompanied the soldiers to the judgment hall. This was a square place, surrounded by a wall in which were prisons, or chambers. One could stand on it and watch what was going on below. There were spectators on it at the time of which I speak. Many Christians were led to the tribunal from a prison which seemed not far from the place in which Agnes had been so ill-used. I think they were a grandfather, his two sons-in-law, and their children, all bound together with cords. They were led before the judge who was seated on a high stone seat in the square courtyard, and Agnes with them. The judge spoke to them kindly, questioned them, and warned them but it was soon evident that the prisoners had been brought out only to be present at Agnes's death. Three times was she summoned before the tribunal. At last, she was condemned to be burned alive. She was led to a stake, made to mount three steps, and the faggots piled around her. They wanted to bind her, but this she would not allow. And now the torch was applied, and again I saw the shining youth shedding over her streams of light which enveloped her as with a screen whilst, at the same time, the flames turned upon her executioner, leaving Agnes untouched. She was then taken down and led before the judge, at whose command she was placed upon a block, or stone. Again they wanted to bind her hands, but again she refused and crossed them on her bosom. The executioner seized her by the hair and cut off her head which, like Cecilia's, remained hanging upon one shoulder. Her body was thrown, clothed as it was, upon the funeral pile and the other Christians were led back to their prisons. During the trial, I saw Agnes's friends standing afar off weeping. I often wondered that nothing was ever done to the friends who showed so much sympathy, assisting and consoling the martyrs. Agnes's body was not burned, nor her clothing neither, I think. Her soul went forth from her body white as the moon, and flew toward heaven. Her execution took place in the forenoon, I think.
for it was still day when her friends took the body from the funeral pile and reverently buried it. Many were present, but enveloped in mantles, to avoid being known, I think. I saw at the tribunal the youth whom Agnes restored to life, but who was not yet converted. I saw Agnes also apart from this vision, as an apparition near me radiant and sparkling with light, a palm in her hand. The aureola which surrounded her whole person was rosy in the center, the rays changing to blue. She was full of joy. She consoled me in my sharp pains, saying, with Jesus to suffer, in Jesus to suffer, is sweet. I cannot describe the great difference there is between these Romans and people of the present day. There was no mixture in them. They were wholly one thing or another. With us all is so indifferent, so complicated. It is as if there were in us a thousand compartments within a thousand compartments. I had another vision. I saw a maiden prostrate in prayer at Agnes's tomb whither she often went by night, wrapped in a long mantle, gliding along like Magdalene to the tomb of our Lord. I saw the enemies of the Christians lying in wait for her. They fell upon her and dragged her off. Then I saw a little church, a perfect octagon, and over its altar a feast among the saints, apparently a patronal feast, very simple, innocent, and yet solemn. A lovely young martyr sat on a throne whilst other Roman martyrs, youths and maidens of the early times, wreathed her with garlands. I saw Saint Agnes and by her a little lamb. Amen.